was praying for me and always telling me, do you guys have a friend who's just always like, hey man, stop messing around, come back to the Lord. You know, he was one of those and, you know, ever since we were little, ever since we were young, he was so special to me. And even as we got older, I, I got to minister with him, you know, at my first uh, pastorate in L.A. as a youth pastor uh, when I was there. Pastor Peter was there alongside me, just showing me how to do everything, and you know, um, you know, showing me how to do ministry and be a pastor. And, um, I was very thankful for him. And taught me everything I know, and um, you know, he's he's just somebody that always encourages you and inspires you. You guys need someone like that. Anymore. Somebody that you look at and you're like. Oh yeah, I need to love God. You know, like, oh yeah, I, I should love God more. You know, and he's one of those. I'm so glad that he's a part of my life. I'm so glad that you guys get to meet him and um, hear from him today. Uh, he's one of the best Bible teachers I've known, so I know it's going to be good. Yeah, I, I really hope that your hearts are wide open and your ears are open to hear him out today as he gives you the word of God. So as he comes up, can you welcome it with a very loud clap. about that moment and he said he wanted to carry that here. He got an invitation to come here and he was like, you know what? I want to bring God's glory to you. And that's what he's pursuing. Very few people is the people that you know who pursue different things. You know, people pursue different things in life, you know? You might be pursuing career. You might be pursuing money. You might be pursuing a girlfriend all these things that people are pursuing for their own things. But very few people actually pursue what God desires, the will of God. And the, to, uh, the person who has actually worked in their soul to surrender their own desires to pursue God's desire, there are very few people you can find that. And you have that as a pastor. So you must remember that. You know, one of the things that he says it's really coming from that place of wanting you to experience the glory of God. Because when you meet God's glory, when you meet Him, your life is forever. You cannot live for the things of the earth because it's all, you realize this is all fake. There's a kingdom that is coming. 
And that's what I'm preaching about. That's what Jesus preaches about. That's what, that's what I want you to catch today. You must hear the gospel of Jesus Christ that says, kingdom of God is at hand, meaning it's within your reach. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. Those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you want to hear God's kingdom, if you want to serve, if you want to meet God, you have to be poor. You have to be hungry and thirsting. If you are full already from the satisfaction of the world, then the gospel is not for you. Now, the same thing happened for Pharisees. Pharisees, they experienced God. I mean, they didn't experience, they had religious status. They were satisfied with that. And when God challenged them, you must be poor in spirit, it's like, I know God. I got this thing. The rich people, the Sadducees, their political leaders, they were like, nah, like, I have a political standing. I don't need God. But people who actually went into the kingdom of God before Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders, are the blind people, are the sick people, were the sinners and tax collectors, prostitutes. They were hungering and thirsting for a different life, a life that God is pleased with. Because they know, you know, when you live your life in a certain way that is not pleasing to God, your soul knows. Yeah. You're made in the image of God, and your soul knows something's off. So it's like, I don't know. Like, I, I, you know, people, there's reason why people who, like, you know, you make it all, like, they're rich, but they're still, like, in bondage. They're not happy. Because they're made in the image of God. And unless you know what that is, your life cannot feel rest. This rest that comes from God's presence. Where you and God is at peace. And there's this rest, this Sabbath, that comes upon your life. And I really felt, as I was like observing you guys and worshiping with you, there is a hunger and thirst here. I, I sense it. You guys have a hunger and thirst here. When Pastor James said, everyone raise your hand. You guys all raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I, have to say, I have to say, it's not like either you're just good kids or you're actually, you're encouraged to act. You've been wanting to worship God in that expressive way, but you were just taking that call and invitation and you just went for it. One of those two. <laughs> we'll be the other. Right? We're going to pursue the Lord right now. Uh, I want us to turn to Genesis. Chapter 1. We're going to read all the way to chapter 3. <laughs> no. We're going to go through 1, and one 2, 3. Yes, Lord. We're not going to... I'm going to summarize all for you because it's a lot to read, right? You could read on your own after after this. I want you to read this. I'm gonna tell you right now. Chapter one and two is a perfect image of what God desires for everyone here. And chapter three is what messed everything up. And you know, honestly, Bible would have been chapter one and two. There would have been two chapters. But chapter three happened. <laughs> which is fall, the sin. So God has to write all of this <laughs> to restore back to 1 and 2. That's what it is. If you read chapter 1 and 2, and if you read Revelations 21 and 22, you will see the same imagery. So you know that chapter 1 and 2 captures the heart of God. Amen? Amen. So... Before we jump into this, like, do you guys know your theme verse? Proverbs. Proverbs. Three, five. Chapter three, verse five and six. Well, I only wrote down verse five. <laughs> verse <laughs> five. It's, it's verse five and seven. Five through. Yes. Look at, uh, look at me here. We're going to just repeat the verse here. This is my one of my life verse. I memorized this in my heart. Okay? I want you 
to repeat after me. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. With all your heart. With all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways. In all your ways. Acknowledge Him. Acknowledge Him. Then He will make straight. Then He will make straight your path. Your path. Verse seven says, "Do not be wise in your own eyes." Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Turn from evil. Turn from evil. All right. I want you to remember that verse. That that theme verse, we're going to keep coming back to it over and over again. The, the retreat theme is submission. Submission. Or you could say surrender. Submission is a um, word that you know modern people don't like. It feels oppressive. It feels like slavery. It feels like you know um, it's a force against you. But Bible, when Bible talks about submission, it's not in that terms. When Jesus Christ submitted his life on the cross, it was not because the Father forced him, but it was, a, it was an offering to God. It was his worship, saying, Lord, my life, I give it to you. Take this cup away from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Submission. God, who knows how to obey, God is not the person that always commands you what to do. He also practices what he preaches. He submits. He submits himself. Jesus will never ask you to do stuff that he will not do for himself. You'll see that in the Bible. All throughout. Everything that Jesus calls us to do, he did it himself. Submission is a willing surrender. Submission is a willing surrender. In the Bible. In the world, it's about like, you know, in, you guys watch UFC? Yeah. No? Okay. Submission is that one when you like, when you put a, another person in a position that they cannot escape. It's forced upon you, right? That's the world's submission. It's called slavery. Or it's called, uh, you know, uh, oppression. God is not about that. He's asking, we're waiting for your willing surrender. But what are you surrendering to? That's what we got to watch out for. So, you know, we're is going to be submission to God the Father. Okay? Tomorrow in the morning I'm going to talk about submission to Jesus Christ. And the, in the last session it's going to be submission to the Holy Spirit. Very basic, easy to remember. I hope that, but then this is a profound truth that you must understand that really has to, it's going to shape how you go about your life. Um, I'm going to uh, pray for us and we'll dive into the Word, okay? Holy Spirit, we desire to hear your voice. There is open heaven here, access to the throne room of God where we get to receive grace, grace to change, grace to be transformed, grace not just to forgive our sins but set us free so that we can become like you. Teach us. Give us this grace tonight. It's already been done in the heavens. Let it be here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Chapter 1, 
verse 1. We're going to read till verse chapter, no, verse 2, okay? Uh, let's read all together. You guys have ESV? Okay. Why don't I read one verse and you can read the other? Okay? Uh, only up to chapter, uh, verse 2, okay? Alright. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of waters. I'm going to stop here. We're gonna, I'm going to summarize the next things for you. And I'm going to do some quiz to test your Bible knowledge. Okay? Now, you see, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form. Everyone say without form. Without form. And void. void. It means it has no without form. It's just stuff. You know, there's a difference between stuff and stuff with purpose. Right? I, you can just have stuff like this. This is a stuff. Right? But it doesn't have any purpose. But there's a stuff like this. This is a stuff. But it has purpose. It has substance. Earth, in the beginning, was without form when void. Void means empty. It has, you know, when you write a check, but you got no money in the bank, it comes out <laughs> void. And like, this check means nothing. So, you could be, same thing with your life. Before God, you're just earth without form. And void. That's how. That's what the. That's the state of cre creation. I mean, I'm not. I'm sorry. State. State of the matter. That's how things are. They're just without form and void, unless. What does it say? This and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. This word hover. It's not like, um, you guys know ho what hoverboard is? Mm -hmm. You guys know? Uh, they used to be popular, I think. I don't know the trend now. So. There used to be hoverboard like we're used to like ride like this. <laughs> People used to like do that. God is not like hovering over the hover like this, okay? That's not what this hover means. Hover in, this Bible, in, in the Hebrew is marakaf, meaning it's a, it's a, a form of a bird, a mother bird, embracing, embracing this material, this matter. Meaning, what God is doing is nurturing. He's nurturing. You know, when a bird hovers over something, it's usually an egg or over the young. And the mother bird, the hen, is about to give birth to something, give life to something. It's nurturing. And this is the word that is used in the Bible. God as like a mother bird, hovering, nurturing this matter to form it and to give us meaning. And what is, it, what is he filling the earth with? And what is the content that God is filling me with? That we need to pay attention. The first thing, day one, what does God create? Let there be light. light. Interesting, there's no sun, moon, but there's light first. Right? There's a scientific reason to that. But I'm not going to get into it. But um, if you're interested in that, I want to talk to you. Um, there's, there's a very interesting theory here. But God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from darkness called night, and there was evening, and the, there was morning, the first day. And then, second day, what did God create? Spirit. 
space. Who's this space? Who's this space? <laughs> wow. God created expanse. Separated heaven from uh, waters from waters. He created space. And also he said, let the waters gather into one place. I'm sorry, that's not that's not the second place. Second uh, second there. He created space and called heaven, and then um, and that was so. There was morning and uh, evening, the second day. And the third day, what does God create? On the third day, anyone know? Land, yes. God creates land. He gathers all the waters into one place. Okay? And then God said, let the earth bring forth vegetation. That's also the third day. He creates plants as well. And then the fourth day, what does God create? Anybody know? The fourth day, God creates sun, moon, and stars to govern the day and night and seasons. God is creating seasons. And then, on the fifth day, God says, let the heavens swarm with the living creatures. And God creates birds. And the Bible says, and God says, let the waters steam up and on. Be filled with the living creatures. And God creates fishes and all the living creatures in the ocean. The fifth day. And then on the sixth day, what does God create? There's multiple things. God creates huh? living creatures where? On the land. God creates living creatures on the land. Bring forth livestock. He brings forth little creeping things on the earth. Every creeping thing on the earth. God creates everything. And then on the sixth day, he also creates another thing. It's not a thing. It's not a... Um, creation, but this one is different. I want us to pick up from verse 26. It says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our, what? Image. Image. After our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. Verse 27. Can we read this together? This is a verse that is kind of separated from other verses to give emphasis. Let's read this together, okay? One, two, three. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. On the sixth day, God creates man and woman in his own image. Now, you might be thinking right now, I know this Sunday school teaching, God creating these things. Like God's creating these things, and God created everything, and God created me to look like Him. But you have to understand this. This is not just a Bible study about, this is not just a Sunday Bible study about um, what God made. Okay? I want you to pay attention to me. It's not just about what God has made. It's all about what He 
ultimately desires. Chapter 1 and 2 reveals to you the totality of what God lives, breathes, and also even dies for at the end. This is God's purpose. This is God's purpose for the creation. You and I are not meant to be just a creations that just live on the earth. You have a special purpose that if you forsake this purpose, you end up living and wasting your life and you face God, that's where the judgment comes because you have squandered the most treasured thing that God has given to you, His image. We're going to talk about that. What is the image of God? And what is the purpose that God has for us? You know, chapter 2, it goes deeper into this picture of man and woman creating. It gives a microscope view of God's process. It says God takes the form, takes the dirt from the ground and forms it into a man and then he says he breathed into him the nostrils, his breath of life, his spirit. Something out of God went into man. You have to understand, something out of God he put it into man, whereas everything else, God has spoken and there was. God has spoken, there was things that, are, that became to be, became to be, but when it, became, when it comes to man, he puts his own breath into the man. And that person, that being, becomes a living soul became a living soul carrying the image of God. Do you know what that image is? It says that in his image you were created in his life after his likeness. Do you know what that language represents? I want you to turn to, it's an ancient language, then you have to turn to the ancient passage. Chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. It talks about genealogy of descendants. And you're gonna, I want you to pay attention to a language that's not sound very familiar with yeah. Verse 1, it says, This is the book of generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them and blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named them Seth. What do you notice here? What do you notice here? What was the language that you saw that was repeated in Genesis 1? In his image after his likeness. That image represents family. That represents family. God, when God was creating us, he was creating family. He was fathering us. He was wanting to create sons and daughters who would carry his likeness, his image, his will, and his purpose. And you know what? You know what's 
crazy? That's all God wanted. So the creation, when God created heaven and the earth, and everything in there, God was simply creating a home for his family. You know, when I have Moses, uh, uh, we have, he's two and a half years old, and we, you know, he's a pretty much a COVID baby. Um, he was born right before the lockdown. You know, before he was born, we prepare a room for him. We have one, one bedroom apartment. So we were like trying to use a living room space, create a corner for him with a nice view. <laughs> and we filled his crib with toys and blanket, camera. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, like, you know, and we got all the clothes for him. We got everything ready. You know, any good parent will prepare a place for their children before they arrive. Could you imagine you're, you came home and then you're like born? It's just like, dude, I was just, I was just born, man. I can't even open my eyes. But you come home, there's nothing. Your parents were not prepared. You're like, um... Where, where should we put him? Just, just, just put him on the sofa. <laughs> you know, there's no place for you. That means they weren't thinking about you. They weren't prepared for you. They didn't really think about the responsibility and the weight of having a family. But that is not God. God is a good father. He's a good family man. He prepared a place for you and I so that we can dwell with Him. That's all that God wanted. Doesn't that blow your mind? How humble God is. Like you may have a desire. You have a desire, right? You have a desire to become like rich or like famous or become like Elon Musk. You want to create something crazy. Cool. You want to invest in Bitcoin? Anyone here investing in Bitcoin? You want to be rich and you want to like you know create the next meme coin or something? <laughs> or you want to be oh here you go. You want to be a next TikTok star? <laughs> Anyone here do TikTok? Everyone here. You know, <laughs> right? I don't do TikTok because I don't know how to use it. But uh, hey, this is crazy how. Can I talk about that a little bit? Just you have to watch out for TikTok because they are they're incentivizing you to watch stupid things and like dumb things and it's funny. And you know what? You know what's crazy? TikTok pays people who create those contents. So they so that you know when people see it, it's like they make money and then now young people are wanting to become like TikTok star. They're thinking like, dude, why do I need to go to college if I can just be stupid and just do dumb things and I make money? You gotta watch out. Because in China, TikTok is different. You know that TikTok is a Chinese app. In China, TikTok is, the, the, the engineering is different. They actually reward people who are engineers, who are smart. Who are creating things, young people who are creating things, they incentivize them to post these things so that young people are motivated and see these things and like, oh, I want to strive to be like that. So watch out. Watch, watch out what you look at and what you, what you laugh at. Because if you keep watching those things, you know, it's, 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 it's not good for you. <laughs> Going back to the Bible. <coughs> You're not meant to be a TikTok star. You're not meant to be. We have all these different desires. But God has a desire that he's willing to die for. That he sent his son for. That he was willing to carry the cross for. And he was willing to resurrect and restore all things. He promised that I'm going to restore all things to you. And what is that? 
God wants home, this earth to be a place like home, where rest is. Like God said, on the seventh day, God created rest. And he created people who are called to be family to God. That's what God wants. God is not motivated to make a name for himself. He didn't create the earth to live because he felt lonely. He created the earth and you and I so that he can share. He can give his breath to you and he can give his purpose to you. He can give his life and share his life with you. God is motivated by love. He's not motivated by self actualization or self self promotion or self gratification God is motivated by love which is selfless and giving that was the whole purpose of why God created the earth is so that you can share in his love and his, in his goodness for sure you know chapter 1 verse 30 the Chapter, I mean, I'm sorry. Chapter 2, verse 1, it says this. Then God had created all that he had made, and he said, very good. Very good. That word, very good, never comes out of me. I want to say that again. That word, very good, it comes out never again in the Bible. God never calls anything very good again. This is it. This is all that he desires. And if there's anything good later on that comes out of the Bible, it's called good news. Salvation. Of what was broken and lost. In chapter 1 and 2. So I'm giving you a picture of who God is. Yeah? You guys get the picture of who God is, right? What is motivated by what his greatest desire is and what his purpose is for you and I so that we will be part of his family and we will carry his image and share his goodness here on earth. Now, what happened? What happened to us? Why are we so sinful? <laughs> why are you so lustful? Why are you? Why are people warring and killing each other here? What happened? Are we like the? Isn't America one of like best nation on the earth? Like with most technology, greatest technology, greatest wealth, all these things. But like, there's so much. Corruption. There's so much brokenness. You know, have you, who, who's been to Korea? Yeah? I'm going to tell you right now, Korea is probably one of the funnest places and one of the most advanced, technologically advanced place to be on, like, you know, in terms of the, as a nation. Their IT, top of the notch. Their healthcare, <laughs> I got, I got, my wife and I got a um, full health checkup. They did 21 tests, like MRI, uh, MRA, MRI, um, whatever, like colonoscopy. You guys know, you guys know what that is? <laughs> you don't want to know that. Uh, endoscopy, everything. Within, we got like 21 serious tests within like two and a half hours. In America, that would take you two and a half months to get all that test done. They have amazing technology. However, you know that they have number one suicide rate. What's going on? Why are people so advanced now and so affluent? Korea is so much more affluent than they were 50 years ago. They're actually number 10. That small nation that's size of, not even size of a California, they're number 10 in terms of GDP or something like around there. 
they're crazy. But how come there's the number one suicide rate? What happened to us? Here's the thing. I want us to read chapter three. Chapter three, verse one, says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of fruit of the tree in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the tree, of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So when, here, pay attention here. So when women saw that the tree was good for food, that it was the delight to the, where? Eyes. Eyes. That the tree was to make, to be desired to make one wise, she took up his fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. Then the what? Eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves open cloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord, the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the tree of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Everyone look up here. What happened in the garden? There's a detail that we're going to have to fill you in. Everyone knows the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, right? The Bible says God created the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. And there's another tree that is in the middle of the garden. There's actually two trees in the middle of the garden. Anyone know what the other one? Tree of life. Tree of life. There's two trees in the garden. In the middle of the garden. God said, don't eat of the knowledge of good and evil. When you eat of it, you shall die. Serpent comes and says, challenges your knowledge of the Word of God. But did God really say that you shouldn't eat of the tree in the middle of the garden? And if you do, you're going to die? And the woman says, the Lord God has said, you shall not eat of the tree that is in, she says, it's in the middle of the garden. But that's not what God said. Do not eat of the knowledge of good and evil, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. So she doesn't know exactly the instructions. And then she said, lest you shouldn't even touch it so you die. But that's not what God said. God said, do not eat of it unless you die. So she's a little bit unsure. I remember it's a tree in the middle of the garden, and I think you're not supposed to touch it either. And the devil sees his opening. Oh. <laughs> you don't know the word of God. He challenges you. Lies to you. No, you could eat it. You could eat it. And if you eat it, the reason why God's telling you not to eat it is because you're going to be like him. He's holding something back from you. He's take, he's, he doesn't have a good intention for you. 
he actually wants to keep you down here. But why stay down here when you eat of it, you can be up here with him. You can be like him. And then the woman was, hmm, it's not a bad idea. So wanting to become wise, wanting to be like God, she took up the fruit and gave some to her husband was with her right next to her. You gotta understand, you can't blame the woman because the man was right next to her. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> the man was right next to him, so passive, just watching. <laughs> like, that's not what he said. <laughs> he heard it. It was his responsibility to tell it to his wife. But he didn't do anything. Men who are passive, you gotta watch out. Don't be passive. You gotta, you gotta be a warrior spirit. You gotta like fight sure. against the devil because the devil's coming after you. So if you just stand, then you being passive can fall into sin too. You have to know that. But here, here's the thing: like if you don't know the word of God, God, the enemy can just lie to you. Anything, anything goes. If you don't know the Word of God, if you don't read your Bible, the enemy can put his thoughts, good ideas in you. But that leads you to death. Proverbs it says that there's a way that leads that seems right to a man, but that leads to death. Proverbs chapter 14, verse something. Right? <laughs> there's a way that seems right to man. That leads to death. So what happened in the Bible? What happened to the in the garden? Man and woman, they didn't want God. They didn't want his purpose. They wanted to create a life for themselves. They want to be God themselves. Why do you why would you need God if you can be God yourself? Why do you need to listen to his instruction if you can just have choice of your own? If you can be a boss of your of your own life. So wanting look, she says the eyes, the desire to be wise, it seemed good, delight to the eyes and desired to make one wise, and she took of it, and her eyes were opened. And what she saw was not God-likeness of herself, but was her nakedness. It was her vulnerability now. Lack, brokenness. And here's the thing, they were always naked. They were always naked. But what happened is that when you sin against God, the glory of God leaves you. Actually, you leave the glory of God. Mm -hmm. God wants to be with you, but you choose to step, or step away from God's presence. As soon as you step away from God's presence, you feel insecure. Mm -hmm. You feel afraid. You feel like you need to hide. You can't be honest can't be truthful. You can't be just you because you feel there's nakedness, there's lack, there's vulnerability. So what do they do? They hide behind trees. They hide behind creation. They use creation to make up what was lost. Mm. You see that? Mm. People use creation. Cotton. <laughs> Cover up the nakedness. <laughs> If I was naked, I would be so insecure. It would be actually very inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> the nakedness, it comes from God not being with you. You not wanting Him. That's called sin. Sin is you. <coughs> 
you sing to God, I don't need you. That's all it is. Sin, the word sin in the Bible, it means missing the mark. You missed it. It's like you have a target practice, right? You shoot an arrow, there's a target, you're supposed to hit that target. That's called score. <laughs> I don't know. Bullseye, right? But if you miss it, if you hit somewhere else, that's called sin. You missed it. We missed. When you sin, you are missing God's purpose for your life. You missed it. God wanted home and family with you, but you missed it. You wanted something for yourself. You wanted to create a life of your own. You wanted to be God yourself. You don't need a father. I can teach myself. So this is why chapter 3, verse 5, of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 7 is very important. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge it. Then you will make your path straight. Do not be, the opposite of all that is, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn from evil. After sin, after this knowledge of good and evil entered into your physical body, you now have sin living in your flesh. Your flesh wants to dictate what is right and wrong, what seems right in your own eyes. Does that make sense? The fruit of the knowledge of good and evil is in all of you. It's in our flesh. That's why Jesus had to crucify the flesh. This flesh is now tainted with this desire to determine what is right and wrong, good and evil, but not governed by God. God was always going to teach his children what is right and wrong, just like any good father does. It's just that we're not supposed to learn it from a tree. We're supposed to learn it from God Submitting to him like a son, mm -hmm. learning the instructions from the father, mm -hmm. how to inherit his inheritance, how to inherit the father's inheritance, the creation, how to govern it well, how to rule over it, mm -hmm. not serve it, not live for money. You don't live for creation. That's not your purpose. That's very insulting to what you got, God is creating you for. You don't live to just survive, pay bills, buy clothes, put stuff on your nakedness. That's not your purpose. God has a purpose to make you sons and daughters who have his image like a king, like a lord, like a uh, a person who knows how to govern well, have dominion. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we said, I don't need you, God. I'm gonna trust in my own understanding, lean on my oh yeah, lean on my own understanding, trust in myself, and I'm gonna acknowledge myself in all my ways, and I'm gonna make my path straight. That's sounds really sound like a mess doesn't it sound like a message of the world right now trust in yourself with all your hearts lean on your own trust believe in yourself in all your ways acknowledge yourself you deserve it then you will be, you will, you will be whatever, like famous, you'll be cool, you'll be true to yourself.
self-glorification, self-trust, self-love, self, everything self, self, self. That's against what the Word of God is saying. The Bible says, trust in the Lord. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And He will make straight your path. And Jesus says, Follow me. Follow me. Believe in me. Jesus has come to show you how to go back to the way of the Father. By restoring what was broken, which is your trust in God. That's the gospel. A way back to the Father. I'm going to wrap it up soon. Guys, you guys have a choice today. Whether to continue to walk in the way of Adam and Eve, which was to, to become wise in your own eyes, to become a God yourself. You don't need, I don't need, I don't want to submit to God. I don't want to learn from God. I don't want God to tell me what to do. I don't trust Him. You can live that way. And you might be successful. You might become rich. You might become famous even. The Bible is clear. You can build a great house on the sand. But when the storms come, when the floods hit, the house collapsed. And great was the disaster. That's the parable of Jesus. But those who hear my words and put them into practice, they're like a uh, they're like a person who built their house upon a rock. There's a flood that came, and then there's a storm that came, but the house stood. You have a choice today to continue to build your life on the sand when God comes to judge it not stand. Because he's going to come with fire. And anything that does not survive the fire of God, the judgment of God, the, the refining, the, the truthful eyes of God that sees through everything, anything that you do, you can be very, very successful in the things that just don't matter. That's the saddest life that you can live. You can give yourself to all these great things, can be successful to the things that God just doesn't care about. Because in the end, what matters is what God says about you at the end. Or you can go back to Genesis 1 and 2, which is possible now because of Jesus Christ. He has shown us the way back to the Father. A lot of people think that Jesus Christ came to die for your sins. Yes. But that's half the story. He didn't come so that you can escape the consequence of sin. That's not the purpose of your life. It's not to escape the consequence of sin. But he has come so that you can pursue the glory of God. For sure. He has come to show you how to receive Holy Spirit in your life so that you can live again. Mm -hmm. Like Adam received the breath of life again, which we lost. Mm -hmm. Now the Spirit of Jesus comes to breathe once again. Come on. Receive Holy Spirit. John chapter 21. So that you can truly live 
as a father has purposely to them to carry his image and his likeness, to rule like Jesus Christ, and to be an heir with him. We're going to talk about that too. But first, you've got to make a choice. Are you going to still, are you going to keep living your life in your own ways and becoming your own God? Or are you willing to now go back to God the Father and say, Lord, I need you. I need you to teach me how to live with you. I repent of my ways. I want Jesus. I want the ways of God. I want God, I want the Holy Spirit in my life to lead me, not my wisdom or what seems right to my eyes. Because there's, there's a way that seems right to a man but leads to death. But the only way that leads to life, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen? Amen. I want us to pray right now. And I want us to respond to this message. Call for God here. And I really believe that there's some people here that are stronger and thirst for righteousness, which is the right things, the things that God said that God sees it as right. God sees it as good, which is his purpose, his desire. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be satisfied. If you are here to say, God, I want to follow you, but I don't know how. So, God, I enroll myself to the school. Of Jesus Christ. Teach me your ways. I no longer want to live according to my wisdom, but from the conviction and the instruction that comes from the Holy Spirit and the Bible. I don't want to live trying to gratify my own self but I want to live to glorify God. Meaning, I want to make, I want to, I want to just receive, I want to embody God and who He is. Yes, good. You know, glorifying God is not like, like all spiritual and stuff, but it's like a very simple concept. When my son, Moses, listens to my instructions and walks with me and he listens to what is good and what is truth, what is honorable in, my, in our family and he embodies that he's glorifying our family what we stand for what we are about he's embodying the principles of the Father that's what glorifies is, is you becoming like God. Wanting to become, wanting to receive and to be taught the ways of God. To have the image of God in your life again. So if you are that person, I want you to just repeat that. It's just a prayer. I'm coaching you to pray, and then we're going to have a time for you to just lift up a prayer to God. God is here. I've been fasting for you guys, I've been praying for you guys, and I really sense the hunger of this place. God, to God, this time is so serious. This time what he lives and breathes and dies for to bring his sons and daughters back to his glory, back to his home. This, he gives us life with us. 
This time is very precious. Don't take it lightly, please. If you're that person that wants to be discipled by God, say, I want to follow Jesus, not my way. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I want to know the glory of God. I want to follow the ways of Jesus Christ. I want you to repeat after me. Jesus, Jesus. I want to follow you. I want to follow you. I repent of my ways. I repent of my ways. I repent of my pride. I repent of my pride. I repent of my sins. I repent of my sins. I repent of my unforgiveness. I repent of my unforgiveness. All the ways that made you sad. But I want to follow you now. But I want to follow you. I want to walk with you. I want to walk with you. I want your Holy Spirit. I want your Holy Spirit to live in me. To live in me. To teach me. To teach me. To fill me. To fill me. To become like you. To become like you. Teach me your way. Teach me your way. Can you all rise? And I want us to just just worship God. Don't worry about the uh, person next to you. You, it's, it's about you. You responding to God. You're not going to be accountable for your brother's life or your sister's life, how they live. You're accountable for your own life. So there's no need to, there's no time to worry about other people. It's just, right now, we got to deal with our life with, with the Lord. I want you to pray that song if that's really true.